are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm David Morton, a Change and Development Officer within the Improvement Service and I've been running this webinar series for about a year and a half uh, as part of the Scottish Local Authority Change Managers Network which is now open to the wider public sector in Scotland. Um, I'll chat a little bit more about that um, towards the end of the webinar. Today our speaker will be John Seddon who will be talking about the Vanguard Method and in, in Public Services. I'll very quickly just ha uh, go over the housekeeping before I hand over to John. Um, on your screen you should have a small grey box and in the grey box there will be a couple of tabs. One of them will say, uh, one of them will be a questions box. At the end of the session there will be a question and answer and if you have any questions then please keep them coming throughout the course of the webinar. Also if you have any technical issues at all throughout the webinar please put these uh, in the question box. I'll be monitoring this throughout the course of the webinar and we'll get back to you as quickly as I can if you've got any technical issues. Um, finally this will be a recorded session and Following the webinar, there will be a short survey just to go over the quality um, and ask you a couple of questions about how about your experience for tuning in this webinar. So I think that covers all the housekeeping. So um, I'll quickly I'll hand over to John there. Um, you should be able to see John on your screen, and um, I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you. Well, good morning, uh, Scotland, um, and welcome. Um, first time I've done this so it's kind of very interesting sitting here talking to uh, a blank screen with a little picture of me in the corner um, but I hope uh, I hope I'm coming through to you now when I sat down to write the Whitehall effect a couple of years ago one of the things that most interested me that I discovered is that really government only started kind of um, getting involved with uh, determining how the public sector should work in Margaret Thatcher's era um, in the 35 years since Thatcher, we have effectively doubled in real terms the expenditure on public services, uh, a trebled it on uh, health services. Uh, but in that book, I make the case that uh, despite the massive investment, we haven't improved public services, we've actually made them worse. Uh, well, the good news is uh, there is massive scope for improvement still, and a lot of it requires undoing uh, the things that we've been doing in the last 35 years. Um, and at the end of this webinar, I'm going to tell you where you can access materials that would help you understand how to do that. <clears throat> Before I do that, a little bit about Vanguard. Uh, I, I, I'm one of those people who got lucky. I got lucky in the 1980s in two different ways. Um, first of all, I was an occupational psychologist. I was studying organizations and change. Um, and I uh, got invited to uh, do some work on why TQM programs failed, uh, which is most interesting. Um, I, I learned that a lot of the uh, implicit theory in the toolbox was diametrically opposed to the theory of the firm. I was heavily influenced by the work of Deming. Uh, if you haven't read Out of the Crisis, you should. It's a really important book that explains what's wrong uh, with conventional management and he implores us to understand and manage organizations and systems. Uh, and I also learned that you can't change a system with a toolbox. But that set me on the road to how do we understand service organizations as systems and change them from the way they currently are. And that's what I'll be talking about later. The second way in which I got lucky uh, is I met a director that I worked with uh, and we had a very great success on our first occasion. Uh, and then we worked together for about 12 years in every job that he had. Uh, most of them were chief executive jobs and most of them were turning around organizations in the private sector that were failing. Uh, he had absolute courage uh, and that afforded us the opportunity to learn a lot. Uh, he didn't mind if we got things wrong um, uh, and so through that period I learned a lot about how to change an organization from a conventional command and control design to a systems design and that's what the Vanguard method does. Well today <coughs> we are, Vanguard is active in nine countries around the world and in every country that we start we grow. Why is that? well because of the impact of the results. So let's talk about the public sector. Um, over the last 30 years you would have seen that we have industrialized uh, public sector services. Well what do I mean by that? Um, it means we've gone for things like call centers, uh, back offices, uh, more recently digital services. 
managers believe that uh, it's all about transaction costs. You know, the digital's cheaper than the phone, and the phone's cheaper than face to face. So, let's reduce our costs by reducing transaction costs. Uh, we believe that we should manage the activity of the workers, uh, the number of things that you do, that we should have standard times, we should have service level agreements, uh, we should inspect the workers' performance. Uh, we worry about what I call the core paradigm, uh, which is uh, how much work is coming in, how many people have I got, and how long do people take to do stuff. Uh, and all of this uh, is sometimes described as belief in economies of scale. Well. If you have an organization that's designed according to those principles, and most of you will, uh, what you'll discover uh, is that it produces failure demand. Um, so if you go to the front end uh, and listen uh, to what customers are saying when they hit the system um, and think about it from their point of view, um, you can distinguish between value demand, which is what we're here for, uh, and failure demand, which represents a failure to do something or do something right for a customer. You know, like you ask, I asked for a green one, you sent me a blue one, I don't understand your form, what's happened to this, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm, now my screen has gone strange, it says share my webcam. Hey John, if you could just try to click share your webcam again, I think it's just lost. It's, yes. Oh look, I see you there. now I'm even bigger, it's quite scary, but you can see me, can you? Yes. <coughs> Right now, so failure demand. Failure demand um, is easily understood, but equally easily misunderstood. Um, you know, if you've got a conventional cost-focused mind as a manager, you think, "Oh, failure demand—that's a terribly big cost. You know, let's get rid of it." Uh, and then you move quickly to, "Well, what are the causes? Well, it must be the bloody people. Uh, so we'll bear down on them and make sure they do the right things for the customers." Um, uh, it's not, in fact, the people. Uh, it's the system that's creating failure demand. Um, so uh, it's all of those things that I've just described. You see, if you separate the front office and the back office, you get two different views of a customer. If you bear down on people's activity time, uh, they focus on meeting the activity time, which is not the same as serving a customer, uh, and the same with service level agreements target standards. In fact, if you impose any arbitrary measure down into a service, people worry about meeting the measure, which is not the same as serving the customer. So failure demand is a signal. Uh, it's, uh, you know, here's a great example of how it's understood and not understood. Uh, you know, we've centralized uh, uh, police uh, call handling operations in Scotland, when in fact that project has stopped. Uh, and uh, things have gone wrong, uh, the inspector goes in and reports on it, and the inspector says, well, there's an awful lot of failure demand in the centralized call handling, but they don't understand what's caused it, and indeed, centralizing call handling and designing it as a take one and ship one, which is what they've designed, uh, isn't going to improve the service. It will reduce the transaction costs, but it won't improve the service. So there's a lesson in this for all of us, uh, and that is if you manage costs, your costs go up. So, the true causes of failure demand are all of those things in an industrial design. Now, if you, uh, now, if you stand in a room and tell managers this, you know, things like well, arbitrary measures like targets and standards and service level agreements make your performance worse, they will argue with you. And I'm sure some of you are sitting out there thinking the man is mad. Um, and you can't argue with me at the moment, but you can ask me questions later. But the Vanguard method, uh, it starts with not bothering to argue with people. Uh, the first thing that we do uh, is we take the leaders out into their organization to study it as a system for them to learn the things they have to learn. And these are counterintuitive truths, and I've already talked about one, and that is that uh, if you manage costs, it drives your costs up. Um, Another I've talked about is if you bear down, bear down with targets and arbitrary measures on people, that equally will drive your costs up. And these, these things create more failure demand. So when managers go and study these things, they see them for themselves. Now the other thing they have to study when we take them out to study is the nature of demand from a customer's point of view. That's essential in all transactional services for designing a service that works. So let me describe in basic terms what a good transactional service looks like when it's designed properly. 
The first thing you have to understand is the type and frequency of demand from a customer's point of view, and it should be expressed in customer terms. Uh, you will find when you do that that you have a lot of predictable demands from customers, and you take the high frequency predictable value demands, and all that means is the stuff we now know we're going to get a lot of, <coughs> and you use that knowledge to build the expertise into the people in the front line at the point of transaction with the customer to enable them to serve the customer. Now you also know uh, all of the other less high frequency or lower frequency demands that are going to occur because you've studied it and you place around those people in the front line people with the expertise to serve the customers and when the person in the front line gets one that they're not trained for, they don't know how to do, it's more complicated, it's unusual, they pull help from these experts, they don't pass the work, they pull help from these experts and uh, learn to serve the customer. It's kind of an interesting change in their role. You know, you take a conventional call center job, it's go to work, do 100 calls a day, do it within three and a half minutes, we're going to inspect you, we'll take you for a regular one-to-one, -one, aka a psychological beating. Whereas in this design, you go to work every day and you learn to serve more customers every day. It's quite cool, isn't it? Now, the, the measures that you're concerned with all relate to the purpose of the service from a customer's point of view. So one primary measure is how, what's our capability in handling customer demands at the first point of transaction. Of course, you can't solve all problems at the point, first point of transaction, for example, if you're doing repairs or you're doing planning work, whatever. So you have to have other measures that look end-to-end, -end, complete end-to-end, -end, uh, that again are measured from a customer's point of view. This is a very important relationship. It's a relationship I talk a lot about in my books and on webinars and the like, <coughs> or not webinars, my first webinar, but web stuff that's out on the web. And that's the relationship between purpose measures and method. Okay, And basically, the, 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 the purpose measures and method is a systemic relationship. It's active in your system, whether you like it or not. If you impose arbitrary measures like targets and standards and SLAs into a system, you create a de facto purpose, which is to meet the measures, and you constrain methods, so we get organized around meeting those measures. On the other hand, if you derive the measures that you're going to use from the purpose of the service from the customer's point of view, and you put those to work where the work is done, you liberate method, you innovate, simple. Now, I've just explained to you a design archetype for an effective transactional service. And again, I would say, I wouldn't explain that to managers when I first meet them. Because the, I know what happens. They go, oh, you couldn't possibly do that. You can't have these people in the front line learn everything, and so on and so forth. So <coughs> you don't. <coughs> um, the Vanguard method has first that they have to go out and study and unlearn and see the things that I know they're going to see, so they can see the what and why of current performance and what's driving bad performance. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, because they've also studied demand from a customer's point of view, they can start seeing that if they actually served customers well, then the failure demand was full. But they also learn that if you serve customers well, your costs fall. So there we are, you see. If you manage costs, your costs go up. When you learn to manage value, you drive costs out of a system. And to large amounts. Now, you'll see in a lot of our case material, which is published, and I'll talk about some of that today, that it's not unusual in local authority services to improve, and more broadly public services, to improve the service and reduce the cost by as much as half. That's quite extraordinary, isn't it? So let's begin with some examples, and I'll, I'll take one where uh, it is indeed possible to improve the service uh, and reduce the cost by half, and that is broadly in those services that I would describe as my life has fallen off the rails. So I'm talking here about <coughs> health services, care services, family, drugs, all sorts everything to do with my, my life has fallen off the rails. So let's talk about studying that first of all. You would imagine, wouldn't you, in a civilized society 
that if someone's life fell off the rails and they put their hand up for help from the state, um, that someone will pop along and find out what's wrong and help them get back on the rails. Well, that doesn't happen. You can have as many as a dozen or more people uh, turning up at your house, looking at you through their own specialist lens, filling in essentially the same sorts of forms, um, quite incredible you know, to you, why have they all feel asking me for the information that the last person asked me for, <coughs> looking at you through their specialist lens, deciding whether or not you are for them, being aware of their budgets and having thresholds, so if you know, you're know you not seriously hurt or whatever, and I, we won't help you, you have to get worse before we can help you, uh, that kind of thing, and, and of course they can make their activity targets for assessing you quite easily by closing the case and passing you on, referring you to somebody else. Uh, if you are lucky enough uh, to get a service, <coughs> certainly in England, and I, I don't know whether this is also true in Scotland, I, but I wouldn't be surprised, uh, most of the services in, in England are uh, marketized, so that, uh, they're bought by commissioners. Commissioners think the idea is to you know, go out in the market and find the cheapest service because you know we have austerity. And if you're going to go out in the market and go buy a service for a price, then that, pr that service will be standardized because otherwise you can't compare prices. Uh, and then the problem becomes that if you supply standardized services to people, it helps some of them, but it doesn't help most of them. Um, and this is a phenomenon that you see a lot in systems. Uh, you know, people are, uh, exhibit high variety. If, if you've got a high variety of problems and you treat them to a standardized service, then inevitably some of them won't get the help they need. You see, the commissioners are focused on efficiency, lower cost. Uh, they're not focused on effectiveness. Does this service help people? So <clears throat> I, I think you know the interesting thing about these services is that, is that they're actually the easiest to study uh, because all you need to do is follow cases through the system and ask some sensible questions. One of the most sensible questions you ask when you're following cases through the system, which you can get from all the electronic records, is uh, at what point in time do we actually understand the need and the context for this person? And the answer usually is never. Quite extraordinary. So how do you design a service that works? Well, let's go back to that archetype. We need to understand demand, and we need to understand demand in citizen terms. When we understand demand in citizens' terms, we can construct uh, a group of people <coughs> who will, as individual, will go out. As soon as someone puts their hand up, you go out. Uh, you disregard budgets, you disregard thresholds, you disregard your specialism, and you simply spend your time understanding what's happening for them. <clears throat> their problem, their need, as they would articulate it, but also, most importantly, their context. So if we can understand them and their context, that, and, and demonstrate that we've done that by talking to them, the next thing that we have to do is ask them, in their terms, what does a good life look like? No judgment from us. In their terms, what does a good life look like? Or, in some cases, a good death. Having understood that, the next step is to address the question, well, what can we do to help this person take responsibility for achieving a good life or a good death? And subsequently, uh, we will then provide them with services either from their own family, the community, from the voluntary sector, or from state provision. And those services are limited to the things that they need to achieve their ambition. Simple, isn't it? <clears throat> when you do that, it's quite incredible what happens. Um, a lot of lives are quickly put back on the rails. Good. The cost of doing so is tiny compared to the cost of not helping people, which is what most health and social care systems currently do. <clears throat> I think the most important uh, aspect of, of the results is that demand in the geography falls. 
That means you've got happier people, happier families, happier communities, and I think that's what public services ought to be about. Now, this won't be news to a lot of you, and I know in Scotland a lot of work is going on on the integration of care services, uh, as it is in England. But let me tell you this, that when my people pop into places where they're asked to look at the integration of care services, they've learned to do uh, what we call the fridge test. Okay, and the fridge test. This, this all happened once when you know we walked into a building and they were <coughs> they put them together in a building. We've got the the health people over here and the social care people over here and the OTs and all, right, all the all the different functions stuck them in the same building. Uh, and they say, well, you know, we're, so you work together? Yes, we work together. Well, well, we're, we share a fridge, um, and when you open the fridge, you find that the milk is labelled for health milk and OT milk and social care milk and you see because what you see then on the floor is all we've done is put these people in the same building and they've still got the same system conditions you know like activity measures and activity targets and their own budgets and thresholds it's all still there that's not the way to do it when you integrate the service the way to do it is to have those experts, you know, the OT, the care people, the health people, <coughs> by all means get in a room, but then you've got to go out together and study demand. And when you go out together and study demand, you start to see how important it is that, you know, the skills that you need at the front end are usually not the specialist skills. The skills that you need at the front end are the ability to listen, understand, demonstrate you've understood and go through the routine that I talked about earlier. And we have a number of uh, uh, places that have done that. Uh, and when you do it that way, uh, then you improve the service remarkably and the costs fall dramatically. Now, let me just say something about demand. Because I was uh, in Scotland earlier this week, and uh, a lot of the people running your health service are just like the people running the health service in England and in Wales. Uh, and they say, don't they, well, demand is rising. People are getting older, demand is rising, comorbidities. You, I'm sure you've heard all that. Uh, well, it's not. <coughs> um, we study demand, as you might have noticed. Uh, and what we found when we've studied demand into outpatients, into trusts, hospitals, uh, into care services, and so on, demand is stable, entirely stable, also quite predictable. What is rising inexorably, growing like yeast, is failure demand. Now, that might be a bit of a surprise, but I would just say to you, uh, you, know, you can think I'm mad, or you can get out and go and study uh, and learn the things that we've learned. Now, so, you know, that's, that's a very important group of services, uh, and uh, I shall mention at the end, uh, well, I might as well mention now, uh, we publish a periodical from time to time. The current edition of the periodical is all about people-centered services, what I just talked about. Uh, and if you go to uh, my website, uh, which I'm sh if you can't find it, ask a seven-year-old, it won't be difficult. Um, you'll be able to download uh, that periodical and read practical examples of this work in action in people centre services. Now, in the course of the last 10 years or so, we've pretty well covered all local authority services with uh, similar results. I'll, I'll trot through a few of them, um, but I could talk all day and that wouldn't help. Uh, but if you take, for example, um, housing repairs, uh, I know a lot of you will have uh, housing services, and you take a repair service and you would typically find that it's, you know, it starts, it's got a call center because people think call centers are a good idea because it makes service cheaper. And in that call center, the people are often, what we find certainly in England is that they've got two jobs really, to decide what target applies to this repair because there's a, you know, some things are emergencies and some are urgent, some are normal. Um, so you've got to decide what target applies, um, and you've got to use something called the Schedule of Rates, which is a book uh, with all the problems that occur in a house with the, the list of the materials and the job time. Uh, and that is then, they may, they may pass, the, pass the job to a supervisor, and then the supervisor passes it to the tradesman, 
Uh, the, the supervisor is worried about meeting the targets, uh, as is the tradesman. Uh, but also, the tradesmen often have a bonus um, because you know more work is good. Managers think, um, and then the tradesman is supposed to pop into the house and fix it. And when you you know you think about a simple little design like that, you might think, well, what could possibly go wrong? Well, when you take the leaders out to study a system like that, sometimes you might start by having them go out with the tradesmen and walk into the houses and only address one question, and that is. Uh, how often when we walk in do we fix it um, and they get their first shock uh, and then it's usually less than 40 percent of the time um, and they start addressing the question well why are we unable to fix it um, <clears throat> they learn when they study the system uh, the schedule of rates is no help uh, they also it's kind of interesting actually because the schedule of rates was invented uh, to help cr control uh, repair costs and if you manage costs what happens your costs go up they basically learn that they've got a system here where the tenant who doesn't understand the plumbing is talking to the person in the call center who doesn't really understand the plumbing uh, and between them then they decide what the problem is and that becomes specification for someone to go and fix it and this person who goes to fix it does understand the plumbing uh, so you're never going to get that right. Uh, when they measure, as they must when they study the system, the true end-to-end -end time from a tenant's point of view, from when they first had a problem to when it's fixed, they get another major shock. That while they appear to be meeting their targets, the end-to-end -end time from a tenant's point of view is horrible. And that, of course, is why they've got more than 50% failure demand in their call center. And when I say horrible, it can take up to 150 days in these designs to get it completely everything fixed. Now, why is that? Well, because uh, a job is not necessarily a job. You know, someone breaks a window, we've got to board it up, that's an emergency target, but then we might need to do some plastering and some painting and some woodwork or whatever, and these are all normal 28-day targets. So you can see it's not, not difficult for things to suddenly go very long. <coughs> well, how do you redesign it? Uh, back to that archetype, we understand demand from the the tenants, the houses actually, not the people, the houses, uh, you can do that over time. Uh, so you take historic data, understand what the predictability of demand, equip the tradesmen with the necessary expertise to go in and fix things. Um, you design a system uh, uh, where you have uh, uh, what we would call a high, the high, um, uh, the upper level of capacity amongst the tradesmen. That means they're not always going to be totally busy but that doesn't matter because you need them when the work comes along uh, and then you have the tenant call and all you do is have them make an appointment now there are many places in England where they can now make you know, they ask, say to the tenant what day and what time do you want us to come quite remarkable uh, the tenant often says no no I called the council well no no we are the council this is how it works and the tradesman turns up at that day on that time 99% of the time they fix it and the other thing they've done is understand, understood material use from the properties and instead of buying materials on the basis of unit cost, which is a big mistake, if you manage costs, costs go up, they buy materials on the rate of use and they cut time that the materials are in their system. And those two things, being able to go into a house and fix it and only using the materials that we need, reduce the cost remarkably. Um, I'll give you another example, uh, food safety. Uh, in their wisdom, the regulator decided the way to handle food safety is for people to uh, go and visit places where they prepare food, like restaurants, and whatever, uh, according to a schedule. You know, so they have sort of three categories of uh, need, and they go and meet these people. Uh, when they go out, uh, they dress up in funny clothes, they have a clipboard, they don't talk to anybody, uh, and they go through their visit and they go back and then they write about it and they write about the things that aren't quite right. <coughs> and uh, the managers are focused on keeping to the schedule. Uh, when, when they study food safety, uh, what they learn is that this is teaching them nothing about whether or not they're improving uh, food safety. Uh, what was quite remarkable the first time that we, we did this um, is that we had to go to the regulator for permission to redesign. Now, you would have thought the regulator would say, gosh, that's interesting. Maybe we've got this problem all over the country. Uh, but, of course, they don't. Um, they think they're doing God's work, so we have to get permission to redesign it. Uh, and where it's been redesigned, uh, people now uh, don't dress up in funny clothes uh, and not talk to people and go with a checkbook. The check 
this sort of thing. They go out, they meet, <coughs> and uh, their job is to look at what's going on, understand how people are using food preparation materials, whatever it is they're doing, identify the things that perhaps they don't know enough about and help them and return according to what they perceive is the necessary time to see that what they've been teaching is being effected. What's most interesting about this is it radically changes the relationship between the inspector and the inspected. Uh, food, food premises actually ask for help from their inspectors. And so they've got a measure that's going on which is all about the competence of these people in these sites to make sure they're doing the right thing with food. Um, so we've got a, a stronger evidence that this is doing good things. Uh, I could go on about some of the list of potholes. Uh, if, uh, I often say to managers, I want you to lie in the road, imagine you're a pothole, see who comes along and what they do. It's quite extraordinary. <laughs> Someone comes along to measure you, to paint you, and does all sorts of things. Uh, when you study this, you learn that it's, it, it's a hugely wasteful system. Uh, when you redesign it, you have to redesign it with knowledge of demand from the roads, because potholes are, in fact, entirely predictable. Uh, and you design it so people can work in geographies to look after their geography, their potholes. They keep their records because that's helping them improve uh, <laughs> what's happening on the roads, uh, and guess what, again, you improve the productivity massively uh, and you improve achievement of purpose, which is to keep the roads going, and so on. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm just looking at my list here, of other, I mean, I, I could talk about a lot of services, uh, but I think I'd rather, what I'd rather say to you is that it's a very simple message here. Um, that, I mean, I know most of you are improvement people. Most of you will, will be sent out to improve things that the managers think need improving. Um, I realize this is a very difficult position for you because actually uh, when you get managers to study their systems, they find the problems that they've got are completely different to the problems that they think they have. However, uh, that's, the, that's the necessary thing. Now, <coughs> uh, as I said earlier, we're now in none countries. We're growing all the time. Uh, we've spent the last five years uh, building an electronic uh, learning system. And on that system, uh, we put lots of examples uh, from uh, local authorities. Uh, so you know, every example of an application uh, says, well, you know, here's, here's how it's conventionally designed, and you'd recognize that. Now, here's what you learn when you study it. Uh, these are the counterintuitive truths that come through when you study it. And here's how you design it when you understand better principles for design, going back to the uh, design archetype. But we also give a lot of advice on what we call intervention theory. You see, um, if, if you go out and study and then write a report about what you've learned for management, you'll be in trouble. They will argue with you. You've got to get to a place where you help them it may by all means study yourself first of all, but then you've got to recognize how you learned and you've got to get your leaders to go out and study these things because your leaders have to change the way they think. Otherwise, there'll be a train crash. If you go out and help a service learn some things that are counterintuitive and against the current status quo, uh, and then they get on and do these things and the managers don't understand it, then there will be a train crash and that's something that you don't want. So um, <coughs> the other thing I'd like to say to you, before, and we're going to move on to questions in a moment because I'm very interested uh, to you know, see how this has struck you, and I could talk about lots of different services. Um, but so this is what we're this website I think I uh, told you has been in development for about five years, something like that, uh, and we're about it's now in the kind of state where we've had it tested. We've, had it used by lots of people, I'm about to release it uh, into public sector services at a kind of a, you know, a special offer, get lots of it going out there um, because well, we know we know what to do. Um, so if that interests you, uh, you should send an email to me or to my office, that's easy to find, uh, and just say, um, you know, when you do that announcement, let me know. So, uh, and the other thing I would recommend that you read is uh, uh, the People Centre Services. 
So I just want to say one more thing uh, before we move to questions, and that's about regulation. Another thing that's grown massively in the last 30 years is regulation. Uh, you might have noticed that every European country has a better regulation task force, and there's a clue. Uh, sadly, who do they put in charge of deciding what better regulation should look like? Uh, the regulators. Not a good idea. Uh, so we're not achieving much in terms of better regulation. Um, in my book, The Whitehall Effect, I describe how uh, the current way in which we regulate creates a compliance culture. So people in the center uh, decide what it is that good looks like, uh, and then they send out inspectors to see if you can fall. Uh, well, and very often their ideas about what good looks like are not good ideas. Um, and that's been a major problem. Um, uh, that was a major problem with the Audit Commission. I was one of the people who lobbied for the demise of the Audit Commission and that's been successful. Uh, I'm now lobbying for a change in the way we think about regulation. I'm saying that regulators and politicians uh, should be entitled to talk about purpose. So it's back to the purpose measures method model. Uh, and that's legitimate. Uh, but the regulators must cease taking a view on appropriate measures and methods. That should be your choice or your leader's choice in running the services. Okay? If we can do that, we'll have greater transparency. We move from compliance to responsibility and we'll get uh, innovation. So that's my hope for the future. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we've got an awful lot of services following this route, uh, and I'm going to ask David to ask you, uh, or to tell me from the things that you've been typing in, as I understand it, whether we've got any questions. Okay, thank you for that, John. Um, if we'll get straight into the questions. Um, firstly, I'd just like to apologise those that are having pr problems with the webcam. Um, some of them seem to be working and some of them don't. But um, the first question is from Sharon McKechnie, who's, um, do you have any examples on cl cleansing and waste? Uh, cleansing and waste? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, um, well, you know, I should say, first of all, uh, Sharon, I, I, I haven't done much of this work recently myself, so I, I'm busy doing other things, but I do remember being told by my people that in a number of cases uh, we've uh, done things on cleaning drains. Um, uh, what you find, it's you know, drains in the road, um, and it's rather like food safety. Quite a lot of these organizations are, uh, they have to comply with the schedule. Uh, and guess what? You find that the drains at the bottom of a hill tend to be more problematic than the ones at the top of a hill, but nobody recognised that. So, you know, you've got to get off the idea that we're here to comply with the schedule and into the idea that we're here to make sustainable drainage. Uh, I know in Cumbria, uh, for example, uh, where uh, it rains a lot, um, and it rained an awful lot recently, uh, what they found when they did uh, the same exercise is that there are predictable problems occurring. Uh, and so, you know, but this is rather like potholes. When you give people the responsibility for a patch, they work out how to achieve good drainage. Scary, isn't it? Okay, uh, the next question is from Garcia Laws. Uh, do you have any examples of pest control services? Pest control. Uh, yes, I know. I know some of my people did rats in London. Uh, I don't know whether it's written up onto the website. Um, that's all I can tell you. Uh, and uh, and I think we learnt the obvious thing that you know more food equals more rats. <laughs> okay. Um. So another question just come in from Robert McGregor. Um, he has read the Whitehall effect. It's excellent and your arguments seem like a no-brainer. But why is it so hard to persuade managers to change their approach when it seems so obvious? Uh, because uh, we try to persuade them and that's a mistake, as I've been talking about earlier. If you go into a room and tell managers that these things are wrong and they've got to think differently, they tend to kind of think the second word is off, if you know what I mean. Um, the, this is the only thing uh, that slows the growth of the Vanguard method, and that is that people have to be prepared to change the way they think. You see, I'm in, I'm in a fortunate position. You know, we have a great reputation. Uh, we have a great, massive track record. So people approach us and say, well, we want your help. And we say, well, that's fine. Uh, if you want our help, then the first thing we're going to do is take you out to study your system. 
And you know, you, it's difficult for you to do that. You know, you're employed, and they say well, you do as you're bloody told. I'll tell you what the problem is. Of course, they're wrong about the problem. <clears throat> but I, I'm in a position where I can do that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, uh, so, sometimes they'll say to me, "Oh, no, 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 I've got people to do this, John. Take them." And I say, "Well, no, I won't do that because then things will go wrong. Because you won't understand it, so I won't." And they generally come back and they comply and we take them out and they go, oh my God, look what I've learned. I know exactly what they're going to learn, but the point is they learn it. So I would suggest to you, Robert, if that's hard for you to do, and I would understand that it is, <coughs> then by all means, you know, get hold of the materials, go and study some things for yourself, and then work out how to do things that would make others curious, make the managers curious. Curious is an important word because the curious person will start finding out more for themselves, and then you can help them, and you can show them, okay? But if you try, if you stand in a room and tell them, then that could, in extremis, be career limiting. I wouldn't do that. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, next question is from Alex Lewis. Having worked in NHS, I know there is some awareness of systems thinking and evidence of attempts to use it. It's not obvious in local government in England. Uh, why is that, do you think? And what are the implications for integrated care? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So the, the, the question is, there's some systems thinking going on in the NHS in Scotland or in England? or um, I would imagine it was in England. Um, there's some awareness of well, it, but it's not as evident in local yeah. government. Uh, well, um, Mm. No, uh, there are, uh, in towards different local government first of all, um, we have quite a number of sites in local government where the whole council uh, is employing this method. Um, you know, if, you, if you look up uh, Fairham Council, for example, the whole council is doing it, uh, they've saved a lot of money, in fact they've increased their staff pay because they've saved so much money, that's quite cool, isn't it? Um, there have been reports on that in the public domain, um, and there's others. There are others where the whole council is going that way because they've seen the results in some services. Um, in Wales, uh, you know, in Wales, the good news is they haven't got Whitehall, um, and so our best work on integration of services, for example, local authorities of mental health, uh, uh, health and social care, are in Wales. Um, the ministers are listening, you know, it's only a small place, um, so they, they can talk to each other more readily. Uh, very interestingly, in Wales, they have uh, changed the policy. Uh, so instead of it being mandatory for when people pull up their hand for the assessment to be a standardized form, uh, the assessment is now simply focused on understanding what matters to people, uh, which opens the door for the sort of design that I was talking about earlier. Now, why did that change occur? Well, because people from uh, the Welsh Assembly Government uh, were invited it by the people doing this work to come and see what's being achieved, how much money's being saved, and how much better the services are if they're not standardised according to the old policies. You know, so that's good news too. <clears throat> now, on the question of uh, systems, uh, the trouble is, systems is just a word, isn't it? Um, the, I, I, I tend not to use uh, the word systems or systems thinking anymore. I think it was a mistake that I made in my career because you know, ten years ago that I used it all the time. Uh, we were very successful. I think we created a market. Uh, lots of people talk about systems, but there's lots of different approaches to systems. You know, so people might use the word, but they not be might not be doing you know the kind of thing that I'm actually describing, which is a change based on first studying the organisation as a system and then using the knowledge gained to redesign. No, there's no plan, uh, which is kind of unusual. Uh, so I do see uh, a lot of uh, stuff coming out of uh, NHS improvement uh, with words like system on it, and it looks to me like much the same old kind of stuff invented by the centre mandated for you to do out there. And that's not the way to run effective change. Thanks, John. Uh, next question is from Tara Murphy. Do you have any examples of any governments who have taken this approach to public services as a whole, not just in specific areas? If not, how do you go about creating whole-scale change rather than fragmented piecemeal change? Well, I mean, uh, Wales is a great example of uh, integration and uh, you know mental health, social care, and all that, that I just described. You know, that government's got it on board. Uh, the Swedes. Um, 
you know, the most important problem that the Swedes wanted to solve in social care was continuity of uh, care, <coughs> because surprise, surprise, if someone's coming to bath you every Tuesday, it'd be nice if it's the same person. Uh, and uh, the Swedes, uh, like us, thought that's kind of impossible to do, you know, because we want to maximize the productivity of the worker. Uh, so we showed them how to do it, and now that is uh, spread throughout Sweden, because like Wales, it's a small place, they talk to ministers and so on. Um, there's Western Australia. Uh, the uh, policies on mental health in Western Australia have changed on the basis of uh, our work there. Um, and um, oh yeah, uh, most interesting. Uh, we do a lot of work with police forces around the world. Um, uh, we started in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam of all places. There's unusual. Uh, working with police forces, and now uh, the results have been so profound that the, we now have a cell of uh, Vanguard Method people in the center of policing in the Netherlands. Uh, their job is to take this method and apply it throughout the Netherlands. So there, there are examples uh, like that. Unfortunately, um, I have a bit of a roadblock with Whitehall, which is why I wrote the Whitehall effect. I've, um, you know, they kind of inured to listening to anything that doesn't fit their narrative. They get out my nose. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, next question is from Janine Wilson. How does the Vanguard method differ from lean approaches? <laughs> oh, Ginny, you're such a sweet person. Look, I want you to go. I want you to go to the um, e-learning site. Uh, you'll find it on vanguard-method.com, go to resources, look for e-learning, look for what we can learn from programs of change and you'll see an animation on what I think about lean um, and lots of uh, papers in support. Um, you know, I am I frequently asked around the world to speak to lean audiences, you know, and even though I'm not a popular person with them, they invite me. <coughs> um, you know, lean is like the same problem as TQM. You know, people think all the thinking's been done and the, all the tricks are in the toolbox. Uh, did Taiichi Ono, the man who developed the Toyota production system, did he call it lean? No, he said, don't call it anything. They'll expect it to come in a box. Well, that's precisely what the Americans who kind of created lean knew. That's how you sell stuff. Uh, did Taiichi Ono train his managers in tools and send them off to solve problems they thought they had? No, he made them study because you learn that the problems you really got are not the problems you think you have, and so on. So there's just a little intro. I hate lean. I think it's, I mean, I, I, I can see people have got some improvements, but these improvements are marginal compared to the improvements you're going to get if you change the system. But, you know, what the Americans are good at is marketing junk. In all my life, I've seen junk come from America, and lean is just another Another latest example, and I feel sorry for the people who've been duped, uh, but I love helping people get into, get, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the people who've done lean have got the philosophy, but don't really know what to do. I'm happy to help them. Thanks, John. Uh, next one, I think it's just a comment from Jane Bradley. Um, it's hard to understand why measurement of performance by transaction time is not a good thing, particularly in an environment like a contact center. Surely measuring this helps us understand where transactions take too long or where there's a training need or even where a system needs to be redesigned or to measure an improvement. Um. <clears throat> well, okay. Uh, well, fair enough, Jane. And let me give you a positive view on this, uh, that uh, it, it, it may it may measure uh, how long people are taking lead you to address questions like, well, is there stuff they don't know and we should help them? I get that. I get that. But as the as the primary measure for management is a big mistake, because the the cost of service is the end to end. That's the total number of transactions it takes for your customer to get a service. You know, so I mean, we do this a lot in the private sector. It might be uh, that when you, you know when you when you put in the archetype I've described, it might be that at the start the transaction times go up. Well, that's great because the end to end times going down, and we're serving customers. As you get smarter at serving customers, you learn more, time goes down. That's great. You know, so it is important to measure actual time and use it for learning and for resource planning, but you never, never 
use arbitrary measures like you must be three and a half minutes to manage the employee. So thanks for the question. It's a good opportunity to amplify. Um, next question is from Ar Archie Alexander. Um, what kind of time commitment do managers need to make to understand and adopt the systems approach? Well, ultimately, Archie, total. Um, you, know, you can get them started with a bit here and a bit there, but if you think about this, <coughs> these managers, leaders, are going to change from being leaders in a conventional command and control design to leaders in a systems design. And the pr primary uh, requirement for a leader of a systems design is to understand the whole thing as a system, uh, to put in, with the, with the help of the people, the measures that we need to understand and improve the works. And these are all real measures related to the purpose of the service from a customer's point of view and to be the people who are knocking out the roadblocks or any barriers to anything that's going on. So the leaders become much more connected to the work. Uh, and if I find I'm working with a leader who doesn't want to get connected to the work, then I won't work. You know, there's no point in helping them because you know, they think leadership is sitting in a room somewhere reading reports. Well, that's not leadership in my world. That's being a pain in the bum, frankly. Him. The next question is from Daniela. Um, would studying the system be the same as shadowing a person as they do their job? Uh, well, that's one of the things that you do, Danielle. <coughs> um, certainly, uh, and indeed, you know, what, what I would emphasize um, is that when you go and study a system, so if you, if for example, you take health and social care, like I was talking about earlier, uh, you've got to follow the cases, you, or, you, or more generally, you've got to follow the work. So you don't ask people what they do. You watch the work and see what people do. Okay, if you ask people what they do, you get a different story from what actually is going on. So, you know, if you're doing housing repairs, start with you know the moment someone rings up for repair, and you if if you can to follow it on records or follow it live, see what actually happens, uh, and then how you know the failure demand comes back. And so you've got to follow the work. Don't never never ask people. Don't read the procedures manuals. Don't ask managers. They won't know. It's John. Uh, next question is back to Sharon. Um, in Glasgow, we have adopted this method to support citizens who have cancer. We offer a holistic service that deals with emotional and financial support. Whatever the person needs, this has transformed the way we deliver services. That's cool. Just a comment. Um, That's cool. Next question is from Beverly Finch. Uh, public services are politically driven. Even if managers are curious enough to embrace change in our approach, how would you suggest we can be successful when the government is still focused on targets and costs? Well, I, uh, <clears throat> well, let's take costs. Uh, I understand the focus on costs, but what I found is that when you can demonstrate evidence that better services are much, much cheaper, uh, then you get, you know, you get an extension of the method, as I've said, in places like Fair and lots of councils in the UK, despite our government, which is even nastier than yours in, in this kind of world. Um, uh, so you know, I wouldn't worry about costs. You can demonstrate, and then you start talking to them about the fact that there's value that drives cost out, don't manage costs, and all that sort of good stuff. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, it, uh, what was the other dimension, David? Uh, it was targets. Oh, targets, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, well, the thing I noticed when I was up in Scotland earlier this week is there's a big debate going on uh, around uh, targets, and there's people recognizing that, you know, they haven't got it right yet. They're kind of going, well, you know, targets don't really work, do they? But they don't understand why. Um, now, I would say to you, don't, you know, don't go and have an argument about this. Um, you you go to wait for the opportunity where you can take someone out and help them study so they can see that a target or indeed any other arbitrary measure, this is something I learned from Deming, always makes performance worse. Okay? Now, they also talk about accountability. Okay? Uh, and I find myself saying to ministers, well, accountability is what's left when responsibility has been taken away. And what you need is responsibility. You know, so, so it's about... <clears throat> having them make good choices of measures that relate to purpose. And this, as I said earlier, that's how regulation needs to change. This debate will carry on. Uh, you know, the, in, in England, we're, we're kind of way ahead of the, you know, the, we've gone off the targets idea. That debate's going on at the moment in Scotland. Uh, Wales are ahead of England. Uh, you know, I often say to managers, you can learn it today, you can learn it tomorrow, you die without learning it, but targets make performance worse. End of. And 
just a final two questions, um, both from Keith. Um, have you done any work with RBS, and do you still recommend using a mystery shopper? <laughs> All right. Uh, no, Keith. I haven't done any work with RBS. Uh, they have a really stupid um, improvement program they call Workout, uh, which is top of the line, pathetic. Um, uh, I do. I mean, we do an awful lot of work with banks all over Europe, um, and you know, in our private sector work uh, with bank, indeed in Australia, and in, we're doing a whole bank in South Africa, so we know a lot about banking. Um, <coughs> but no, I haven't worked with RBS. But you know, they might call me one day. You never know. Um, Mystery shopping, uh, no, mystery shopping's stupid, isn't it? I mean, really, you know, this is someone who pretends to be a shopper uh, and comes along and asks you the questions the managers want asked and makes observations on the things the managers want to know. You know, when I, when I first saw mystery shopping, when it first came about 20-odd um, years ago, I thought, this is so dumb. Uh, but, you know, managers love it because they think it's going to control the worker. No, no, what you find when you go study what's going on, what you find is the workers are not stupid. Uh, they know who the mystery shoppers are because they, they behave like unusual, weird people. And so they turn on the things that the mystery shoppers want to see. Uh, this is helping us understand anything about how to provide better service at lower costs. It's a stupid idea. And, there, and there's an animation on how stupid mystery shopping is on the e-learning site. Okay, thanks John. That's us just coming up for around 12 o'clock when the scheduled session is due to finish. Um, just very quickly, um, you should be able to see my screen now. Um, I'm just showcasing the yep. Change Managers Network Scotland, which this webinar series is a part of. If you've attended today and you uh, want to find out about future sessions or anything that we are doing to support change within local government in Scotland, then please feel free to join this group. Um, we'll also make available the recording of today's webinar and also forward on any uh, links to John's e-learning or any resources which John thinks it would be useful for you to look at to get a better understanding of the Vanguard method. So I would like to thank, uh, a massive thank you to John for presenting to us today and I hope you all enjoyed the session. Um, there will be a short survey just following up where we just ask about the quality of the audio and the uh, and also looking for uh, speakers for future sessions. We've been very good at getting these so far, so if you've got anybody in mind that you feel could contribute to a webinar, then please recommend them, and we can do a bit of follow-up on that. So once again, massive thank you to John, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Um,